I would like to introduce Dr. Peter Domenical. Dr. Domenical is a professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences and a climate scientist at Columbia University's renowned Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. He is the founding director of the Center for Climate and Life, where the mission is to mobilize scientists to better understand the various impacts of climate change and to use that knowledge to lead real change in the private sector. Dr. Domenical is joining us to discuss climate change. Climate change is one of the most complex and difficult challenges facing the world now, yet it is also one of the most divisive. Dr. Domenical will discuss how climate metrics are changing today, why they are changing, and how this impacts people and the global economy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Domenical. Good afternoon. The uh, question I'd like to ask today is a really direct one. Why does climate matter? The answer is that climate shapes life. Climate shapes the very existence of life on this planet. What I'm showing here is an animation of photosynthesis on the planet, both in the oceans and on land throughout many years. And you can see the, the sweep of green of the African monsoon sweeping north and south. You can see the pulse of life in the ocean. The planet is literally breathing with the seasons. Climate fundamentally shapes life. If you don't believe it, just look out the window on any fall or spring day, and that's life shaping, uh, being shaped by climate. So why is climate changing? Well, it's agreed upon by all of the world scientists that uh, climate is changing and that it is changing uh, within our generation. This uh, upward trend here that shows the global warming that's occurring both in the oceans and on land shows this remarkable rise in temperature of roughly one degree centigrade since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. More important is that 14 of the 15 years of this millennium are the warmest ever measured over 150 years that we've been taking these temperatures. So it's really remarkable that we're living in these special times. The bigger question is why is climate changing? And this is the one that gets a lot of people talking. And the best way to think about this is this analysis that was done by uh, Bloomberg News uh, earlier this year. Here they looked at both natural and man-made causes. So that blue line that's moving across over here, for example, was variations in the Earth's orbit around the sun that paced the ice ages. In orange here is solar variability. In red are volcanoes. Volcanoes blow up and they cool off climate for a few years, then it warms up again. We can add all these natural climate changes together and see what the combined effect is. You can compare that to the observed temperature in black, and you can see that there's some comparison, but there's really a mismatch, particularly in the recent years. So then we can ask some other questions. How about land use changes or ozone? These are, again, these are man-made changes, but are they changing climate? Some of them are changing climate fairly significantly, like aerosols are cooling climate a little bit. But really, it's greenhouse gases that are taking off and producing the warming that we're seeing in the recent years. Now what we can do is add all these things together and then see how they interact both constructively and destructively. And you can see that we have a pretty good fit between the human factors on climate change and the observed temperature record I showed earlier. Now let's add everything in together, natural change and also man-made change, and we get a nearly perfect fit. This tells us two things. One is that natural climate variability, like volcanoes, account for some of the climate change we've seen. But it tells us a more important story, which is that the climate change that's happening now, this year and into the future, is mostly attributable to human activities, in particular greenhouse gases. So the next question that I'm often asked is, um, how unusual is this? I mean, has the Earth warmed up like this before? And yes, the Earth has been this warm or even warmer in the past, but it was a time back, let's say, during the dinosaur era, you know, hundreds or 100 million years ago. What's happening right now is that the temperature is rising so quickly in a geological snap of a finger. And so we can ask ourselves, well, how unusual is this? But we have to do a really interesting uh, method, which is that we have to use past archives of climate change preserved in coral reefs or in ice cores, in tree rings, or in the bottom of the oceans. We bring all of this information together to tell us about how climate has changed in the past. And then by combining the past with the present and, and history, we can connect all of this together to see just how unusual today is. So today is the warmest of at least the last 1,000, most likely the last 2,000 years. How do we know this? Well, we combine all those ancient archives of past temperature change with the historical record. So the ancient record is shown here in blue and green, and then the modern temperature-based, thermometer-based record 
of historical temperature change is shown in red, and it shows this characteristic kick up in just the last century or so. That's the modern global warming that we're talking about. That's unique to at least the last millennium. But the bigger surprise, if you will, is what's actually going to happen later in our lifetimes. The way we can make projections into the future is that we assume some kind of scenario that we're going to have a business as usual increase in carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Or we can make other um, assumptions and say, oh, it's going to be, we're going to actually uh, emit less CO2 into the atmosphere. And so we make these projections, and shown here in the solid vertical line is today. You can see the line that extends to the left. That's the historical temperature changes in the past that we've just been looking at. You can see the temperature scale that goes from zero to about six degrees warmer than today. And let's see what the next century or so looks like. There are two really different scenarios. The one that we're currently on based on current emissions and current human activities is the red one. The red one is more like a business as usual scenario and it climbs up to warming in excess of four degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial base. The blue one, the one that I wish I could say we're on, is actually a much more optimistic scenario that says, well, what if we all wore Birkenstocks and we all drove Priuses and we all got along and we all shared resources? The blue one is a much lower emission scenario and consequently it's a little bit less warm, still warmer than today. What's interesting is you take this red trajectory, again, that's the tra trajectory that we're on today, we take that red trajectory and say, well, for a doubling of CO2, the ballpark number is about three degrees warmer than the pre-industrial past. So that may not sound like much, particularly if you're from Minnesota or Siberia where it's already pretty cold and some people might even welcome that kind of warming. But let's just see what happens when you think about that in a, in a global average sense, which is what this is. The future is another world. Three degrees of warming really just skyrockets beyond anything the industrialized or in fact the historical or prehistorical world has ever seen. In fact, it's warmer than any hominin that's human relative that we will have seen for several millions of years. So we now stepped into the next part, the second part of this is that, you know, why does climate matter? Why do people actually care about climate? And I would like to say it's because people are concerned about global temperature, but they're not, we don't live global mean temperature. As impressive as this figure is that I showed, it doesn't really change any of our behaviors, mine or yours or many other people. This is not by itself a very compelling fact. Sometimes people appeal to charismatic megafauna, such as polar bears, to say that you know, we have to save the polar bear, that whole habitat is changing, and, and it's a very emotional appeal to why we should do something. And I would submit that that's a totally valid reason, but again, that's not going to change people's behavior by itself. And least of all, we're not at all persuaded by really awful, terrible catastrophe movies. These three things have been used in the media, by scientists even, to convey climate change, and this doom and gloom kind of scenario just doesn't work. So if we ask ourselves, why does climate really matter to us? For humans, climate impacts what we care about most. It controls our food, it controls our water, it controls our shelter, and it controls our access to energy. Just to give you an idea, the $80 trillion global economy is predicated on a world that was established before the Industrial Revolution. Ports were built where they were because that's what the world was like back before the Industrial Revolution. All the cities emerged based on a climate that we no longer have. As climate is changing, so too does our relationship with the environment through this sector of the economy. So these changes are happening now and they're impacting people in very real ways. So our proposal is that we accelerate the scientific knowledge that we need to adapt and that we partner with business and with finance to reach across the aisle to share climate knowledge so that we can make wiser decisions about our collective economic future. Climate impacts food. Crop yields decline by somewhere between five and 10% for every degree of warming. Remembering that prior number of about three degrees warmer than today, we're looking at something between 15 and 30% decline in, in commodity crop yields globally. Water, this is actually something that Columbia really uh, has uh, demonstrated leadership on, is that as we add more CO2 to the atmosphere, the patterns of where it gets wetter and drier change such that big broad areas become un unusually wet or unusually dry 
and the American West, in particular California to the Mississippi, really becomes a dust bowl of a magnitude that we've never seen. The influence of climate on sea level, climate change on sea level, and then coupling that with more intense storms means that the security of the coastlines, where people live, where we've invested much of our national resources into ports and cities, the sea level really becomes a, a very dominant, very expensive uh, signature of climate change. And speaking of expensive, we can't leave out this idea that climate change really comes with a real price tag. You can think of it as a tax, you can think of it as a cost, it's both those things. A recent uh, Bloomberg analysis, actually that was uh, written up in something called uh, Risky Business, put in an analysis of the warming that we're expected to see to have an impact of somewhere between 1% to 2% of global GDP. For the United States alone, this number worked out to be something in the order of 200 to $300 billion each year in climbing. So it's a big number. And just to give you an idea, this isn't just drawn out of anywhere. Hurricane Sandy was something about $70 billion by itself. So part three is, well, what can we do about it? And this is the part when, when I'm teaching our undergraduates, this is the part where they put down their cell phones, they stop texting, and they come up and they look at me, look me right in the eye, because this is really where I think the future is. This December, or in December 2015, the Paris Agreement was signed by 195 member nations, and they agreed to develop mitigation and adaptation measures to stop global warming. The measures that were brought forward are really a fundamental retooling of how the Earth works, and it's done in a just and fair way. Just to give you an idea, um, each nation developed its own plan of what it would do to try to get us to limit global warming to below 2 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial base. That number is not just picked out of thin air. We believe that to be the sort of hair trigger threshold above which we do not want to cross, because above that is when we start getting bad things happening, like ice sheets melting in a runaway sense. So our way of looking at this future is to really start to tear apart, well, what are the mitigation steps? What are the adaptation steps? And are these things that we can really consider? Is this a wholesale revolution of the world, or is this something that's going to you know, throw us all back into the Stone Age? These are all things that have been said about this agreement, and it's none of those. Really, the way to think about this is not what can be done about it, but really is what are we doing about it, because it's no longer some pie-in-the-sky dream. These are actually changes that are engaged and underway right now uh, that, that took place as recently as six months ago and as recently as about three years ago. So these transitions we're going to be talking about really only came into being in the last uh, several years. First and foremost is that, unbeknownst to many people, is that there's an energy revolution that's underway. Both uh, the growth of renewables, particularly in wind and solar energy, has just taken off. And it's crossed a, a very important threshold which basically means that the genie is out of the bottle. This transition is going to stick, and it has economic roots. The cost of solar panels, which is shown up here in this upper panel, has been declining by 10% per year for 30 years. And just a year and a half ago, it crossed something called the grid parity threshold. That's a fancy term for basically saying that the cost of generating an electron from the sun is at the same price or below that of what it would cost to generate it using fossil fuels. So it basically becomes cost neutral to make this decision. That wasn't true five years ago. It wasn't true th three years ago. Just to give you an idea, the projections from the year uh, 2010 to the present, we've exceeded in the deployment of solar by a factor of 68 times. Just to get your mind around this exponential increase in, in solar deployment. And that's what's shown here. You can see the, the blue histogram is the exponential decline in cost, and then the red peak at the top, the red increasing exponential. The same thing is shown for solar, decreasing cost exponentially and exponentially increasing deployment of capacity, both for wind and for solar. So there's an energy revolution that's well underway, and uh, you know, there's very little that's going to keep that back because it's being driven by really basic economics and need. Some people think that you know, if we were to de deploy solar that we'd have to dedicate you know, one entire state to be covered with solar panels to power the country. And it's really important to get our heads around just how far solar has come along. 
So for example, for the United States, if we wanted to power the entire United States domestic energy electricity need, the size of the area that we need for solar panels to, to take care of that need is just about 100 kilometers on a side. And while that may seem big, it's actually really small. It's this little blue square. That little blue square, were that to be covered with solar panels, could power the entire United States electricity need. Of course, it wouldn't happen this way. The way it would happen is it would be deployed on rooftops. So this is something we could do tomorrow if we had the political will to do so. A, a, a critique of solar is that, well, it only works when the sun is shining, and of course that's true. But that's not true because we now have very efficient energy, high energy density battery storage of the type that Tesla is selling right now that allows us to store energy and then to use it during the nighttime. And to give you an idea of the storage that would be needed to power the United States with that kind of electricity grid coming from solar, it would be the size of the width of one pixel, that's the width of the black line surrounding the blue square. So with this energy transformation, and in fact with all these, tra these, these economic trans uh, transformations that are embedded within the Paris Agreement, there will be winners and losers. And I think that's one of the biggest take homes from my perspective anyway, is that there will be industries that are the equivalent of owning buggy whips, and there are industries that are the equivalent of holding on to uh, technology uh, into the future. And in the buggy whip department, many of the fossil fuel investments are suffering you know, great divestment right now, something in the order of about three and a half trillion dollars divested so far. But more importantly, and again more positively and more engagingly, is that we're seeing the investment in renewables on the order of 12 trillion dollars over the next 25 years. It's just a revolution that's happening right now. So the second part of the Paris Agreement is this idea of developing better adaptation requirements. And these include how we're going to adapt to rising sea levels, how will, how will we adapt to changes in water availability, how will we adapt to changes in uh, heat waves and, and uh, extreme weather events. And it's here where our scientific knowledge really needs to be expanded. And just to give you an idea of where we, where we are right now, this is a plot of the observed temperature in these colored uh, lines between 1975 and 2015. And you'll see that they curiously stop at the year 2000. Well, that was when this study was done, and they made projections into the future, that gray area, saying this is this broad trajectory where we're going to go. And it's worthwhile to ask, well, how successful were they in that projection of, of future temperature changes? And they were remarkably, in fact, for 2015, they were right on the money. So what's great about this is that we have a high degree of skill in saying where, what the future is going to look like. What's challenging about this is that we really need to reduce our error bars. You'll notice the width of this gray bar. We really have to have a much better understanding of how it's going to impact not only glo global temperature, but specific zip code specific changes in temperature and in rainfall and, and uh, uh, sea level rise. And this is really where we have a fundamental new opportunity in front of us. To meet this challenge, to, to address this opportunity, last year we started the Columbia Center for Climate and Life. And the whole premise of the Center for Climate and Life is to mobilize our best scientists to understand how climate will impact life's essentials. Food, water, shelter, and energy, the things people care about most. A good question can be asked, well, why Columbia? And um, unknown, unfortunately, to many people is that Columbia actually has one of the leading, one of the broadest research groups in earth science in the world. Not only that is our department of earth environmental sciences is the number one ranked department in the nation. So the other question can ask, well, why now? What's the, what's the reason for pursuing this at this time? Well, there has been a steady multi-decade decline in federal funding in the basic sciences, so -called, the so-called innovation gap. And that's happening at the worst possible time as we're now facing this, uh, this uncertain future about how climate change is going to impact the things we really care about. And so the center is really meant to meet that gap, that innovation gap. So how are we going to do this? Well, we already are very successful in, in raising federal funds for research. And the university is investing in this as well. But we're really engaging philanthropic support to build up our research base, our funding base, to focus our scientists on the research that really matters, how climate impacts food, water, shelter, and energy. 
So what's new in this is that we're trying to focus the best minds to understand how climate change impacts things people really care about. And then to take this knowledge and transfer it, to inject it into the private sector, into the business and finance communities, so that they can be the agents of change. So we use our best scientific knowledge to shape decisions about our future. So I know we can do this. We've shown this kind of dedication across the board and many other examples, this is just one. But climate is just so important and it impacts every sector of our lives that it deserves our best efforts. So thank you very much.